Alo Có rồi Alo 1, 2, 3, 4 Alo 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 Hello, check. Hello, hello. It works. I think it works. No. If you have any issue, you can know. Oh, is that one that doesn't work? So I don't have to do this one. Oh, this is. Uh, do I want this mic or do I want this mic? Which mic do I want? This mic or this mic? So I keep this mic. Okay. okay. Maybe I should keep this. Okay. Uh, okay. So maybe we should switch this off. Or okay. Oh, then I have two. Yes. You'll be okay. You have two. Oh. Okay. Okay, so uh, just an announcement about the rump session. So thank you for the people who submitted already. I can tell you you're all accepted. Um, we also are going to extend the deadline until 
one o'clock today, so if you do want to submit a rump session talk, please send an email following the instructions by one o'clock, and if we can get the final versions of slides by two o'clock today. Okay, if there's any questions about that, you can email the, the address. Thanks. Uh, so, good morning. Uh, welcome to the second invite talk session of this conference. Uh, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce you the uh, invited speaker, Dr. Hotek Wee. Uh, Dr. Wee uh, obtained a bachelor degree from uh, MIT in 2002 and a PhD from UC Berkeley in 2007. Dr. Wee is now a, a research scientist uh, with ENS Paris. Uh, he did um, many great works uh, in various topics, uh, including uh, public encryption, functional encryption, multi-party protocols, uh, database security, KDS security, and other theoretical topics. Uh, Dr. Wee received uh, many awards, uh, such as uh, Euclid uh, 2016 Best Paper Award, and IMACC 2015 Best Paper Award, Good Faculty Research Award in 2014. Okay, the title of this talk uh, is uh, Advances in uh, Functional Encryption. So please join me to welcome Dr. Hotek Wee. All right, um, thank you very much for the introduction. Um, I'm very grateful to the PC for inviting me here today. Um, it's truly an honor to be here, especially having grown up in uh, Singapore, just, uh, I guess, a couple hundred thousand kilometers down the, down the road, to be, to be back in Asia to, to give a talk. So uh, I'll be talking about advances in functional encryption. Right. So let me start uh, right away with the talk. So we, now all, we, all know that we, now all, we all know that we now live in this era of big data where we collect a lot of our sensitive data about individuals. We collect financial data, medical data, customer data, employee data. And because there's so much of this data, this data is also often uh, stored in the cloud outside of our control. This raises consideration, serious consideration about our privacy. And uh, for privacy, we actually already have a solution from uh, uh, cryptography, namely the notion of encryption. So what traditional encryption allows you to do is essentially to encrypt the data, which is uh, very much like putting a lock on the data so that uh, anyone who doesn't have the key will not be able to learn anything about the data. Now, the problem now with this is that you withhold, if you put this uh, encrypted data in the cloud and you, if you withhold the key from the cloud, then you lose utility. The cloud will no longer be able to compute on this data. So the question is, can we somehow resolve this tension between utility and privacy in some meaningful way? In particular, we want to find a way to be able to encrypt data while at the same time being able to restrict access to the data and restrict the kind of computation external parties can do on the data. Um, right. Let me proceed by example. So the first half of the talk will mostly be on restricting access, and then the, the, the last maybe one third of the talk will be about restricting computation. So let me start with an example. This is one of my favorite examples. Many of you have probably heard it. Uh, right. So imagine you want to do uh, dating in this uh, era of the internet and big data. So the way uh, dating works or online dating works is that you have a user who's interested in uh, meeting someone who matches their dating preference. So the way it works is that they will sign on some dating website. And uh, when they do it, they will also create a profile. So in this dating profile, they will say put uh, all sorts of sensitive information about themselves, their pictures, their hobbies, their age, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so th that's certainly the issue of uh, privacy. So you really don't want anybody to have access to all of this uh, very personal uh, information. So ideally, you want to be able to publish your profile on the dating website while at the same time limiting access to this profile. What does it mean to limit access to the profile? You really want only the people who satisfy your dating preference to be able to read your profile. So for, so for instance, uh, something, uh, a canonical example maybe is that you only want people who are tall, dark, and handsome to be able to see your profile. Um, right. And well, amongst friends here, we know that a far better alternative is to look for people who have a PhD in computer science. 
Right, so, uh, so let's even dismiss with this tall duck and handsome. And for the rest of the talk, let's focus on this example of having a PhD in computer science. So this is uh, new notion, uh, the stronger notion of uh, uh, attribute-based encryption, which was put forth in the work of Sahai and Waters, which basically says that when I encrypt a piece of data, say a piece of message M, I want to be able to uh, specify a policy on this message, say PhD in computer science. The idea being that only people with PhD in computer science will be able to read this message M, and everyone else should not be able to read it. So now you have these users on the system. They are going to have some uh, qualifications or attributes. So for instance, you have individuals with a PhD in computer science. Some maybe not a PhD, just a master's. And then there are people with PhD in uh, other fields. So the way uh, like the dating website works, continuing with the previous example, is that when, when users sign, uh, register on the website, they get a key from the, uh, from the dating website. So this key, especially if you look at the picture, you see that the keys look a bit different. The keys are specially customized to correspond to the kind of uh, attributes that they have. So you have a key for someone with a PhD in computer science, uh, and then a key for master's in computer science, and so on and so forth. And the basic correctness requirement is that if somebody uh, satisfies the policy that's on the message, then they should be able to decrypt the message and uh, you know, find what the message M is, and in this case, find true love on the internet. And uh, otherwise, for anyone else who doesn't satisfy this access policy, uh, with the key that they have, they should learn nothing about the message. So if they put the key together with the ciphertext, they should see nothing. And moreover, we actually want a stronger notion of security, which we want to protect against collusions. So we don't want uh, a bunch of, uh, uh, I guess, unemployed people maybe, I don't know, sitting uh, after drinks on Friday night, sort of looking at their keys together, and suddenly by missing and matching their keys in some way, they can uh, decrypt profiles that they will otherwise individually not, individually not be able to decrypt. So this is a, a very useful and uh, strong security requirement, and this is partly what makes uh, attribute-based encryption so difficult to build. All right, so uh, let's try to build such an attribute with encryption scheme that supports this policy. Um, let's do a, uh, a small warm up. So here's what the scheme is going to look like. The way I describe it is actually going to be a, a symmetric key encryption scheme, more of a warm up, but you can turn it into a public key encryption scheme. So uh, do, uh, let me tell you what the keys look like. So uh, we were, in the system, we're going to create all these uh, random strings. There'll be a random string for computer science, random string for PhD, random string for masters, and a random string for biology. And uh, when the user uh, uh, signs onto the uh, website, they're going to get the strings correspond to all the attributes that they have. So the uh, one with the PhD in computer science will get uh, uh, the random string for PhD and the random string for computer science and so on and so forth. So how, how would encryption work? Um, right. uh, basically, the encryption works by basically taking the, uh, if you want, let's say, only people with PhD in computer science will be able to uh, decrypt your message, then you take your message you are one time paired it with the, um, with, the, uh, with the random stream for computer science, and then one time paired it with the random stream for PhD. Right? So again, this is actually a symmetric key encryption scheme. So let's check that this scheme satisfies correctness. Indeed, uh, if you have the, you know, some of the PhD in computer science can easily undo the one time pass and recover the message M. And uh, for each of these two other individuals in the system, they're going to miss one of these uh, uh, random strings, and basically security follows from security of the one time pass. Now let's see what happens when there's a collusion. So let's see these two people come together. Now what happens? Well, it's not hard to see that basically now suddenly they will be able to decrypt the message, even though each of them individually cannot decrypt the message. In particular, uh, the, the reason for this is a, is, a, is a class of what we call mix and match attacks, which sort of uh, makes is exactly what makes collusion so hard to deal with. Uh, what, what this mix and match attack does is that you can, it turns out you can actually take uh, two, two keys that are not uh, authorized to decrypt the message, somehow mix them in some way and combine them in a different way to create some other matching key that can actually decrypt the message. So in this case, the attacker is essentially taking the, the, the first half of the key for computer science from the one of the masters, and then the, the part of the key corresponding to PhD, combining these two together, mix and match them, and creating a key for a, di a different set of uh, attributes that can actually qualified to decrypt the message. Right. So this means that uh, this scheme is insecure against collusions. In general, any scheme that's susceptible to a mix and match attack is going to be insecure against collusions. All right. So, uh, right. so let, let me uh, tell you how we solve this problem, how we defeat this mix and match attack to construct uh, the first uh, attribute-based encryption scheme for a very uh, large class of functions. In fact, we can actually get attribute-based encryption schemes that, uh, that support all efficiently computed policies, namely policies that are computed by all circuits. Right. So this joint work with uh, Sergei uh, Gorbanov and Vidok Vakuntanathan. 
And the key idea in this work is very simple. Um, instead of working with strings, we want to work with functions. Uh, the main distinction between functions and strings is that, in some sense, a string is one use. If you have a string, you can either give it up or withhold it, so you can only, in some sense, use it once. Whereas a function is many use. Think of a function. A function is essentially a, a collection of exponential number of strings. Whenever you uh, evaluate a function at a new point, you get a new string. The way to think about this function, you should think of it as like an AES function with a fresh AES key. So when you evaluate it at different points, you get a number of uh, independent strings. So this gives you, so the a function is in that sense uh, many use, rather unlike a string which is only one use. Now let's see how the scheme is going to work. Uh, it's going to be, uh, right, so basically, like I said, we're going to replace the string with functions. So instead of having a string for computer science, a string for PhD, a string for biology, and so on and so forth, we're going to have a function corresponding to a computer science, a function corresponding to PhD. The way to think about having a function, you should think of it as having a key for a function. So now, how is the uh, key for each of these individuals going to work? Um, right, so whenever you create a key for the generate key for the individual, you're going to take this function and evaluate it at some random point, uh, where the random point is chosen at random every time you generate a new key. Okay? So the first, uh, the first uh, individual on the right will get uh, two, two, uh, both of these functions evaluated at the same random point S. The next one will get both of these functions evaluated at some new random point T, and the, the third one will get them uh, evaluated at some random point U. Right. Uh, unfortunately, uh, encryption is going to be a little bit more delicate. It won't be exactly like a one-time pet from before, but you just have to trust me that you can design the ciphertext in a, in a special way so that you still have correctness. The reason why correctness is a bit harder here is that we want correctness to hold as long as uh, the individual on the right gets the function evaluated at the same point. So if they are both evaluated at the same point S, you can decrypt. If they are evaluated at the same point S prime, you can also decrypt. And when you're doing your encryption, you actually don't know what this uh, point S and S prime is going to be. So you have to work a lot harder to get correctness that works for all S and S prime. Okay? But trust me, this can be done. All right. So, right, so it turns out uh, this construction, you can see, in some sense, is no longer susceptible to the miss and match attack that we saw from before. In particular, if you try to do what we did earlier, namely take the first half of the key from uh, the second individual and the second half of the key from the third individual, you will see that you actually have functions evaluated at two different points. And we can show, we will design the scheme in such a way that if you have uh, the function evaluated at different points, and these are actually independent, uh, different independent points, then they're going to be in some sense useless. Right, so uh, this sort of shows that mis and mesh attacks doesn't work anymore. But mis and mesh attacks are only an example of one class of collusion attacks. There could potentially be other attacks. So what we formally show is that we have a proof of security showing that this scheme is indeed secure against collusions. Uh, moreover, the nice thing about this scheme, the way I describe it, uh, is sort of, uh, I describe it for a single end gate. Uh, what's very nice is that the way this scheme works is that you can, it actually composes well. So uh, think of uh, from your uh, computer science 101 class, you know that you can take any circuit and represent it as a bunch of gates. And, uh, right. So what, you have, what will happen is that if you want to uh, generate this scheme to any arbitrary circuit, you will basically look at the circuit represented as a bunch of gates. And for each of the wires in the circuit, you're going to pick a new random function. And then uh, and we will construct this function in a way that they glue well together and they can go from uh, one gate to the other and connect everything together. So let me say that uh, prior to this work, we only knew how to construct uh, attribute-based encryption schemes where the policy comes from uh, the class of NC1 circuits. Think of this as very simple functions. Uh, either You can think of this as either Boolean formula or uh, uh, small depth circuits, or circuits of logarithm in depth. Right. Uh, the security of a scheme relies on the learning of error assumptions, so these lattice assumptions, which basically says that uh, essentially uh, solving a random linear system with noise is hard. I want to give you a sense of why uh, working with lattices is so, uh, is so beneficial, why lattices are so powerful. So prior to this work, we only knew how to uh, achieve NC1 circuits, and most of these constructions are based on my bilinear maps. I want to give you a sense of what's so different about lattices that, uh, that has a, uh, a certain structure that bilinear maps don't seem to have. All right. To give you a sense of why lattices are so useful, let me give you a sense of what this function is going to be. Okay? So uh, the function is going to be described so think, remember you have a collection of functions. The function is going to be specified by matrix A. Okay, think of this as a uh, white and uh, short matrix. The input of to a function is going to be a vector. Think of all this as sort of uh, 
uh, matrices and vectors with entries over ZQ for some uh, small number Q. Okay. Uh, right. So uh, the output of the function on input A, uh, sorry, uh, the output of the function A uh, on input P is a vector U such that A times U equals to P. Okay. Um, turns out we actually want this function to be hard to compute, otherwise the, uh, uh, the adversary can forge keys. And in general, uh, you given A and P to find U such that A U equals to P is going to be easy by a Gaussian elimination. So the way we make it hard is to require that you need to find a U with small entries. In fact, the function is going to be a randomized function, and it's going to pick a random, it's going to output a random u such that a times u equals to p. So this is sort of the function that we're going to work with. This function has already been considered before in the literature. Uh, the main twist that we made in this work is uh, to look at this function and realize that uh, one thing you can do is that this function uh, extends. You can think of the input instead of being a single vector p, you can think of the input as being a matrix. So you can stretch this vector p to form a matrix p to stretch this vector from P to form a matrix P. And uh, the, the output of the function is going to be now, instead of being a single vector, it's going to be a matrix U. Okay? So what you want is a matrix U, with, again, with small entries such that A times U equals to P. So what do we gain by stretching this matri uh, vector P to form a matrix U? Uh, the uh, what we gain here is that A and P now have the same dimensions. And they're essentially the same object. They're going to be matrices of the same dimensions over some underlying uh, modulus. Right? So now, you can actually treat this uh, uh, matrix P as a new matrix that describes a new function. Okay? So instead of calling this uh, uh, matrix P, I'm going to call it A2. And now I can consider a new function, A2, uh, that takes as input uh, A3 and outputs some U prime, such that A2 times U prime equals to A3. Okay? Now, A2 and a3 again has the same dimensions, can go on and on and on. And this sort of, the, the, the fact that you can sort of move this matrix on the right to a matrix on the left is essentially what allows us to glue all these uh, functions together. In particular, this is a structure that we don't have in bilinear groups. Roughly speaking, what happens is that once you do a single computation, you're going to end up in different groups. And you will, end up, you will have to use your pairing. And once you use your pairing, you won't be able to continue the computation. Right, okay. So this is sort of give you a sense of uh, what our uh, basic uh, attribute encryption scheme look like. Now I want to go back to our earlier uh, example that I gave and revisit this, uh, this example. So we say that using attribute-based encryption, we can protect the privacy of our profile. Uh, but the problem here is that, in fact, uh, the way attribute-based encryption scheme works is that they actually don't pro uh, uh, provide any privacy for the policy. In particular, your dating preference is always going to be public. And there are many, many uh, settings where uh, actually your uh, dating preference could actually already by itself reveal a lot of sensitive and personal information about yourself. Right? The, the fact that, uh, you know, that you may be gay or that uh, you like kosher food or celebrate uh, Rosh Hashanah, all this could say something about uh, your background. So ideally, we really want a system that can provide uh, privacy for your dating preference as well. In particular, we want a stronger notion, uh, and this is going to be an object that we call practical encryption, that guarantees that uh, for a collection of users who are not able to access your profile, this set of users will also not be able to learn anything about your dating preference, other than that, of course, they don't satisfy your dating preference. Huh? Right, so this is a stronger notion of security that we want to aim for. And uh, in the work, again, with my co-authors, uh, Sergei and Vino, we show that you can realize this uh, stronger security notion, namely the operator encryption, again, for the class of all circuits, and again, from the same assumption as before. So from standard assumption about hardness of problems in lattices. I want to give you a sense of how this construction goes. Right, so, uh, right, so we have a profile, and we have some access policy C, and our goal is to hide this policy C. All right, so uh, the first idea is, wow, not that we, we want to hide this policy C, but at the same time, in some sense, we need to know the policy C. To, uh, the po we need to know some information about the policy C because we need to be able to check whether we satisfy the policy. So we still need to be able to compute on this policy. So if we want to hide something while being able to compute on it, what can we do? Well, the first natural idea is to use a home, uh, fully homomorphic encryption scheme. In fact, this idea already came up in a couple of prior works on uh, related topics. And uh, so what we want to do is we will encrypt the, uh, the policy, the circuit C that we want to hide with, let's say, a uh, symmetric key FHE scheme. So there's some uh, key K that we encrypt. And then 
uh, this, is, this is what you do during encryption. And in addition, you will, in some sense, have to provide the key K. Otherwise, the other party will learn nothing whatsoever about the circuit C. Okay? So what do we gain from doing this layer of FHE encryption? Uh, what we gain is that, um, well, we have this key K and the FHE ciphertext. Um, the FHE ciphertext we no longer have to protect because it's protected by the uh, security of the FHE scheme. So instead of having now to protect an uh, arbitrary circuit C, we only need to protect a key K. Okay? So did we really gain anything? We still have to protect something. And it uh, turns out we do. Because uh, uh, when we want to protect a circuit C, well, actually, uh, we have to be ready to protect any arbitrary computation corresponding to the circuit C. Whereas uh, when we come to protecting the key K, it turns out we only, need, we only use the key K to do a very specific computation, namely to do FHE decryption. So now, instead of having to protect arbitrary computation, we only need to protect a very specific computation. And it turns out that the existing FHE schemes the computation that's done on the secret key K is an extremely simple function. Essentially, it corresponds to just computing an inner product. And uh, constructing a scheme that protects this very simple function sounds to be much easier, and this basically solves our problem of uh, trying to protect the circuit C. All right, so that's sort of uh, probably one of the more technical construction in this talk. So, so far, I have taught you how to build expressive uh, attribute-based encryption schemes and predicate encryption schemes from lattices. By expressive, I mean we can support very complex policies. In particular, we can uh, su uh, support policies corresponding to all circuits. Right. In the next part of the talk, I want to g also give you a sense of some other constructions that are based on uh, uh, bilinear maps. So uh, this, uh, the, the schemes that we get are not going to be as expressive as the one we get from lattices. Uh, I alluded to earlier, this, these schemes will not be able to su support the class of all circuits. Rather, they can only support classes of smaller circuits. But what's nice about these schemes is they're going to be more efficient, and they're actually going to satisfy stronger notions of security while being really reasonably efficient. Uh, in particular, uh, from bilinear maps, we have constructions of uh, efficient attribute-based encryption under, for these uh, shallow circuits under standard assumptions, like DDH, uh, on both sides of the parent group. And uh, this, uh, this scheme satisfies very nice properties. They are, like I said, fairly efficient. They satisfy a very strong notion of adaptive security. What adaptive security means is that the adversary is allowed to pick the collusions and the policy uh, arbitrarily and adaptively, uh, you know, in an adaptive fashion. Um, however, there's a price that we pay uh, to this uh, efficiency and uh, strong adaptive security, namely that uh, these schemes often come with extremely complex security proofs. And that is the reason why this proof has to be so complex, because uh, attribute-based encryption schemes are a very complex object, and they provide very strong security guarantees. In particular, they are public key primitives. Uh, they provide a strong notion of many-time security, where many-time corresponds to the fact that adversary can get many secret keys, um, Right, so many secret keys for many many times. And um, in this particular case, like I said, they satisfy a strong notion of uh, adaptive security. Uh, so uh, for the next couple of minutes, I want to tell you a series of uh, uh, results uh, uh, that shows, essentially shows how to sort of uh, get this uh, uh, very powerful attribute-based encryption scheme and very efficient ones without paying the price of this uh, complex security proof. Uh, in particular, uh, what, this, uh, what this series of works showed is that instead of worrying about this extremely complex attribute-based encryption scheme, let's start by focusing on a very simple object. Okay? Uh, think of this as a, this is going to be an object that's in fact going to be information theoretic. It's basically going to be, this object is going to be very much like an attribute-based encryption scheme, except uh, all of the, uh, uh, the difficulties are toned down. So instead of being a public key primitive, this is going to be a private key primitive, so the adversary doesn't get to see some public key. Instead of requiring many times security, this primitive only needs to satisfy one time security. And instead of requiring adaptive security, this primitive only needs to uh, satisfy non-adaptive security. Okay. So what this series of works show is that they provide a compiler that goes from this uh, much uh, simpler primitive that's much easier to construct and produce the attribute of the encryption scheme. So this comes at a price, of course. It, uh, it requires, it assumes some combination assumption, namely only works with our bilinear groups, and, but understand the assumption of bilinear groups. Okay. So uh, right, in particular, what, what, uh, the, the outcome of this now works is that in, you get simpler proofs, you get a unified proof of security, and you get improvements from prior works in terms of our concrete efficiency. So I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have the time to really describe how this, uh, 
the, the, this entire result. Uh, oh, still, I want to give you a sense of how this compiler works. Uh, and I'm going to focus on uh, compiling, sort of focusing on property one. Namely, I want to give you a compiler that goes from a private key primitive to a public key primitive. Okay. Right. So, uh, right. So, uh, right. so think of your favorite. Uh, so I'm going to be a bit vague about what this uh, private key primitive is going to be. Uh, you can think of it as uh, a MAC or a, uh, or a uh, symmetric key or private key encryption scheme. Okay. So what the compiler do is it's going to start with a scheme, that's a private key scheme, and it's going to produce a public key scheme. Uh, and security of the public key scheme will essentially come from security of the private key scheme. Okay. So we start with a private key scheme, and uh, think of this private key scheme uh, uh, generating some private key. So the thing of the private key is just a collection of scalars in ZQ. So what would this new scheme look like? I'm going to tell you what the public key is going to look like and give you a sense of how you can relate the, uh, the uh, security of this public key scheme to the security of the private key scheme. Okay. In the new scheme, uh, I'm going to tell you how to sample the public key. And the sampling algorithm works as follows. Instead of sampling a bunch of scalars, I'm going to sample a bunch of vectors. Okay. The, the dimension of the vectors, roughly speaking, uh, depends on the assumptions you're going to work with. So, but the height of these vectors are essentially going to be constant if you're working with DDH. Okay. So what is the public key going to look like? Uh, in the public key, the public key will contain a matrix A. Think of the matrix A as specifying your, uh, your underlying uh, assumption. So this A may be specified to DDH assumption. In general, it's specified to a subgroup assumption that you want to work with. Okay. So the public key is going to contain A together with A times WI for each of these uh, vectors W. All right. And uh, in fact, the, the, the new scheme is going to work under the DDH assumption. So all of these values that you publish will in fact be in the exponents of some cyclic groups. All right. So the main observation is, the first observation I want to see is that this vector WI actually has entropy given the public key. And that's because A times WI is compressing. The length of uh, the vector A times WI is shorter than the vector WI. So you can imagine that WI still has entropy. And this entropy is what we're going to use in our security reduction. Uh, right. So in fact, uh, right, so formally, what is this entropy? Uh, if you pick a random vector C, with high probability this random vector C is not going to lie in the span of A. And this will mean that it's easy to see that given A times WI, C times WI is uniformly random. And this will be your, uh, your hidden entropy. Okay? So your security reduction, what you're going to do is uh, your security reduction needs to rely on the security of the underlying private key primitive. So it's going to need to create a key for the underlying private key primitive. And the key for this underlying primitive is going to be this hidden entropy. So you're going to create a private key scheme where the secret key, uh, the scalar wi, is going to be the vector c times the vector wi. Okay. Right. More generally, uh, this, uh, the way I describe this uh, 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 compiler works well for certain applications uh, that sort of uh, maybe sort of like a warm up, maybe if you don't need the full fledged power of bilinear maps. But in bilinear, bilinear, uh, bilinear map schemes, the compiler is going to be more complicated because, uh, roughly speaking, it's because you need to review something about this, uh, this uh, WI on both sides of the uh, pairing group. So then, in this case, instead of uh, picking a vector, we're going to pick a matrix, all right? uh, a square matrix, say. And, uh, and then in the public key, we're going to uh, 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 publish A and AWI. In addition, we're going to pick some other matrix B, which corresponds to the subgroup assumption on the other side of the pairing. We will publish this matrix B, and in addition, publish WI times B. Okay. Uh, again, as before, we'll be able to show that WI again still has entropy given the public key. Now, in this setting, the proof is going to be a bit more delicate because the output of the function is no longer compressing. Um, but basically, a variant of the proof uh, from before works. The key observation here is that if you pick a random vector C and a random vector D, okay. uh, then with high probability C is going to lie outside the row span of A, and D is going to lie outside the column span of B. And you can then show that given A times WI and B times WI, C times WI times D is going to be uniformly random. Okay. And then this will be the uh, hidden entropy that you use uh, to create the key for the uh, original private key scheme in your security reduction. Right, so I have sort of outlined this uh, compiler. 
this was uh, roughly speaking, this is the compiler that was used to uh, to simplify the construction of attribute based encryption schemes. And this compiler turned out to have, and the more general concept of compiling a private key primitive to a public key primitive has a bunch of other applications. Right. Uh, yes. So in a in a series of works, uh, we show that uh, using this sort of a compiler technique, you can turn a pseudo random function into an identity based encryption scheme if the uh, pseudo-random function has a very good algebraic structure. Uh, in particular, if we now start with, say, a tightly secure PRF, we end up with a tightly secure uh, encryption scheme. And that's how we construct the first uh, tightly secure uh, IB understand assumptions. All right, I want to say that you will see uh, uh, another of these results later uh, at, at this conference on uh, Wednesday. And uh, also, using the techniques that were developed in the series of works, uh, we also showed that you can use these techniques to uh, solve a problem that's not related to, uh, to uh, attribute-based encryption, identity-based encryption. And using te techniques uh, earlier this year, we were, we were able to construct the first CCA secure encryption scheme with a tight security reduction, and that doesn't rely on pairings. Right. So uh, this compiler can also be applied to other primitives. For instance, you start with a uh, uh, you can, for instance, use it to get non-interactive zero-knowledge protocols. You can compile a symmetric key, a private designated verifier uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge protocol to a publicly verifiable uh, non-interactive zero-knowledge protocol. All right, this is, uh, we also showed that using this paradigm, you can also get simpler and more efficient construction of structure preserving anxious. So here, you can basically uh, start by just constructing a, a structure preserving Mac, and our compiler will turn this Mac into a signature scheme. All right, so uh, that's roughly uh, most of the technical part of the talk. And uh, so far, I've talked to you about sort of review the state of the art for our attribute based encryption scheme from pairings and from lattices. Now, let me talk about the uh, bigger problem of functional encryption. So in functional encryption, you have a piece of data D. Again, as before, you have keys corresponding to functions. So uh, for function f1, you have a key for f1, and function f2, you have a key for f2. And uh, the basic correctness requirement is that if you have a key for f, and you decrypt an encryption of D, you're going to compute f1 of D. You have a key for f2, you compute f2 of D, and so on and so forth. Right. Uh, uh, similarly, like before, we have a strong uh, collusion requirement. Namely, that uh, if you have the key for F2 and F3, you should learn uh, nothing more than the union of what each of the uh, individual keys tell you. Okay, so you should learn nothing more than F2 of D and F3 of D. So the big holy grail in the study of functional encryption is whether you can construct functional encryption schemes for all functions. By all functions, I mean all circuits. The way we now have uh, attribute-based encryption scheme for all circuits and predicate encryption scheme for all, uh, for all circuits. Right. So, uh, right, so I want to quickly review the state of the art. So, right, so not surprisingly, we, we have a affirmative, affirmative answer to this question if we are uh, willing to use uh, multilinear maps or obfuscation. Uh, right. But unfortunately, uh, the status of multilinear maps and obfuscation are a little bit unclear. Uh, we don't really have uh, very strong candidates. So we really want to focus on construction that are based on our standard hardness assumptions for which we have a better understanding. Uh, and uh, for results of this kind, uh, much less is known. For instance, we know we do have functional encryption for uh, understanding assumptions, but only for extremely simple functions, essentially functions that are related to computing an inner product. Okay. And here we have construction based on uh, both uh, bilinear groups and uh, lattices. Um, if we are willing to relax the security guarantee uh, to bow the collusions, what this means is that um, Instead of the adversary being allowed to get a, uh, excuse me, a bounded number of secret keys, uh, we, we, we have a system. We, uh, the, 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 uh, uh, we, we consider if we rebound on the number of uh, uh, secret keys that the adversary can get, then we can, have a, then we can construct a scheme that, uh, that is secure as long as you, the adversary doesn't get more keys than what this bound is. The catch here is that uh, the, uh, the complexity of the scheme, the size of the public key, the size of the cyprotent, and so on and so forth, are going to grow with the size of this bound. Right. And for this, uh, for this uh, right, but in this bounded collusion setting, we can indicate functional encryption for all functions. We can get it essentially under a very standard assumption. Uh, public key encryption plus, uh, you know, 
slightly more structured uh, public key encryption type assumption. So basically, you can get it from hardness of factoring, DDH, uh, LWE, and so on and so forth. Now, if we want to really um, focus on the setting of unbounded collusions and sort of go beyond a very simple function, then basically the state of the art understand the assumptions is the uh, result that I told you about earlier, which is the practical encryption for circuits. So you can think of radical encryption of circuits. The way I describe it has to do with a message, but you can also think of it in the, as, a, as a, uh, a weak kind of functional encryption, a one-sided notion of functional encryption. What this means, roughly speaking, is that think about, for instance, functional encryption where your functions are Boolean, so it only offers one bit. Uh, a practical encryption scheme uh, for this uh, Boolean function basically is one that says that uh, if, you only, if you only get keys, that uh, for which a function evolves to false, you learn nothing about the data D. But uh, if you get keys for which a function evolves to true, you may, we no longer provide any guarantee for the, uh, for the privacy of the data D. Okay, so you get this one-sided notion. You only get security of the data D if the function evolves to false. And no security requirement, no security guarantee whatsoever when the function evolves to true. Right, all right, so uh, let me now uh, conclude some open problems. So I want to highlight there are many, many open problems in the study of uh, functional encryption, actually with encryption and predicate encryption. I want to focus on uh, two particular problems that came up in the context of this talk. The first, of course, is to try to get functional encryption from standard assumptions. And uh, here, the most promising is, of course, lattices, because even for predicate and attribute-based encryption, we only know how to get construction from lattices. Yeah. Uh, the main obstacle uh, here is that uh, we, we don't have a very good understanding. So to construct functional encryption schemes, we need, to we need to have techniques to satisfy a very strong security notion, namely what's called predicate uh, strong attribute hiding. So in the language of predicate encryption, where I talked about uh, encrypting uh, messages to a policy, you need to provide some very strong uh, privacy guarantee for this policy. And uh, in this case, we still don't have a very good understanding of uh, uh, strong attribute hiding. Uh, there are basically only a very small uh, number of papers that achieve full uh, strong attribute hiding, and most of these papers are uh, uh, written by a very small group of people. So even in the, uh, so we, ha we know techniques for strong attribute hiding in the uh, pairing-based setting, and we basically don't have any techniques for strong attribute hiding for, uh, in the uh, lattice setting. So even getting strong hide, uh, attribute hiding for under lattice type assumptions for extremely simple functions, slightly more than inner product is a big obstacle already. Right, uh, so this is sort of the, uh, the big open problem out there. Uh, at the other extreme of things, if we think about uh, sort of uh, construction based on bilinear groups, uh, one of my favorite questions is whether you can get uh, IBE schemes that are extremely compact. Right? So what I call the petite IBE. Um, right, so we want IBE, so now, right now, basically the standard of, uh, state of the art for IBE schemes under standard assumptions uh, that are fully secure, basically says that you basically need four elements in the ciphertext and four elements in the secret key. Um, the question is whether we can do better. And uh, like I said earlier, uh, sort of in this uh, compiler uh, results going from private key to public key primitives, any advances in this problem is likely to have very strong applications. It will give you shorter signatures uh, and also applications to uh, non-interactive zero knowledge and possibly structure based the signatures. Uh, it's worth well noting here that the, uh, the, uh, the, the best uh, state-of-the-art pairing-based signatures, so signatures from bilinear groups that I know of under standard assumptions, are actually based on the ones that you get from the IBE scheme. So, uh, so there are many other open problems, and I'm happy to talk about, uh, tell you more about it offline. I uh, also want to take this opportunity to share some of my thoughts uh, on, uh, on the study of, uh, uh, on, uh, the study of uh, functional encryption and attribute-based encryption. Because this uh, sort of uh, slightly more personal and uh, maybe slightly more controversial, and I'm very happy to talk more. Right. Um, the first is that uh, I want to encourage everyone working on this uh, topic to always think very critically about the theoretical and practical uh, context of your work. Oh, my work right. uh, case study adaptive security. So as I said earlier, we have uh, very efficient uh, uh, adaptively secure schemes on bilinear maps. Uh, and the adaptive security is extremely well motivated in practice, actually. It, carry, it, ca it captures the class of very realistic attacks. In the real world, you really expect that your adversary can make adaptive choices rather than uh, having to make some non-adaptive choices. 
right? And so it's a well motivated in practice. And in fact, it was also partly the study of looking for techniques, theoretical techniques to handle adaptive security that, uh, that motivated the work on uh, dual system encryption, which is this very powerful proof methodology that uh, sort of underlying these compilers from private key primitives to public key primitives. So in some sense, a study of uh, adaptive security, which is motivated by practice, has had very rich uh, implications for theory. So taking this forward, what should we do next? Um, so let's say we go to a practitioner, and uh, the practitioner asks us to recommend a scheme that they can use. Naturally, we want to sort of recommend a scheme that's adaptively secure. Uh, the question then is, do we really want to, do we, should we be recommending the state of the art adaptively secure scheme? Uh, Right, which are, like I said, they're fairly efficient, but sort of the, uh, efficient in a slightly theoretical sense. In particular, it turns out that if you are willing to, in uh, if you are willing to settle for non-adaptive security, you can usually get uh, slightly better efficiency. Uh, the uh, better is constant factors, but these constant factors do uh, matter a lot in practice. So, what this roughly means is that uh, you're going to go to the practitioner, you're going to ask, do I want, do you want to pay a factor two for this uh, adaptive security uh, that is provable under some standard assumptions? And as it turns out, one, non, most of these non-adaptively secure schemes are actually not so bad. They are more efficient, and they are actually typically also already adaptively secure in the generic group model. So if you ask the practitioner, then you will say, well, they'll come back to you and say, I really want to use the more efficient scheme because I care about this factor of two, and uh, is there really anything wrong with uh, using a scheme that's only proven secure in the generic group model? Do you expect to have any attacks? And the truth is, uh, it's probably quite unlikely to have an attack. In fact, uh, like Nadia pointed out yesterday, if we really want to attack a scheme, there are far better ways to compromise the scheme than to look for adaptive attacks that, uh, that are not captured by the generic group model. So this means that we, we should not over, we need to be a bit careful about uh, when we motivate our research on uh, adaptive security to make sure that we sort of draw the line somewhere between the practical motivation and the, and, uh, the theoretical motivation. It's important that uh, we re when we sort of uh, evaluate research on adaptive security, that uh, we really think about uh, 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 solutions that also bring along our new theoretical uh, techniques. Because there's a limit really to how relevant they are in practice. In some sense. All right, uh, the other one to say is that to stay away from obfuscation. Uh, by this I mean that uh, Right. So the, the, uh, the, uh, right now, the, uh, the literature on uh, attribute-based and practical encryption and functional encryption has become extremely rich. We have very powerful proof techniques, and a price we have to pay with powerful proof techniques is that the proof has become very complex. Uh, in spite of this complexity, I urge everyone when working on this topic to make sure to try to uh, make your proof as simple as possible, to constantly revise your proof to simplify them and try to write them as well as possible. Even though the community may incentivize the use of uh, obfuscation, no pun intended, we should still stay away from using obfuscation. Right. Uh, finally, I hope we bring this message uh, to all of our co-authors and the students we work with. Um, right. Uh, the trouble of working with students, not, not the, the trouble of working with students. Uh, when you work with students, one thing you have to deal with when you try to tell them to rewrite the proof and over and over again, they're going to tell you, um, I don't really want to do this. You know. There are plenty, look at all these other badly written papers out there. They still get accepted. Why do I want to go through the trouble of rewriting my paper over and over again? Okay. At this point, you, you, you tell them um, what Michelle said, which is that uh, you know, when they go low, we go high. Right, so uh, this is sort of uh, the, the concluding thoughts that I have on research and the... Uh, I want to con really conclude by uh, a series of acknowledgements. Uh, all of the work that I presented today are with, mostly with my co-authors, and uh, I've been very, very lucky to work with some uh, very talented individuals and uh, who keep me on uh, you know, going high. And uh, I want to take this time to sort of acknowledge uh, some of my uh, co-authors. Who has, right, not, who has really shown me, uh, not just uh, shared with me the, the technical knowledge, but also the kind of passion that they have for research. Uh, Jie Chen is one of my first PhD students, not officially, I co advise him, unofficially. Uh, and uh, he, showed me, he showed me that sleeping is only necessary as a step towards uh, doing more research. You only sleep so that you can do more research. 
So he was going to go to sleep, and then he want, all he wanted to do is to be able to get ready to do more research after that. In fact, this is an email sent just before midnight, and at 4 a.m. he said, well, I have a new idea. So I guess it works. Um, I've also been working with Iker. Iker took this step further. Um, not only is sleep sort of uh, only necessary for research, uh, you know, uh, I can assure that you know there is something a little bit more than that. So working on a paper for the Eurocrypt deadline, a couple of weeks before the deadline, he told me, you know, uh, I'm expecting a new baby. So at some point, like one week before the deadline, expect me to disappear, and uh, you'll have to uh, work on this paper. And the paper turned out like like about a week before the deadline was actually already in pretty good shape. And uh, you know, I kept sending him email. He kept replying. So I was a bit worried. I wasn't sure when the paper, when the baby is going to arrive. And then at some point, something like three days before the deadline, he wrote an email saying the baby is here. So I'm like, okay, great. Uh, uh, the, the paper is in very good shape. I just have to make a couple more tweaks and then we're ready to go. Uh, only to discover that something like 12 hours later, he said, I'm going over the paper now. So now we have people picking research over sleep, people picking research over babies. Um, the one to sort of really uh, steal the show is my long-term collaborator, Abido uh, Baikuntanathan. Um, right, so uh, earlier this year, we were all at PKC in Taiwan. And uh, while he was there, he uh, went to a hot pot for the first time. So hot pot, if you don't know, you can get it in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Vietnam, by the way. Uh, it's also known as shabu shabu in the Japanese context. Uh, for those who know what uh, fondue is, think of it as a fondue for Asians with meat. Okay. So he went to this hot pot place. At 11.30, I got an email from him saying, uh, am I supposed to cook everything here? So by the way, of course, you're supposed to cook everything. And then a couple of hours later, I got an email from him saying he wants to continue meeting to do research. And we need to do this, finish this research really soon because you know, he's been eating raw meat and he's worried that he's going to die from food poisoning. But, so uh, right, so uh, once again, let me thank all my co-authors and also my colleagues, my family and my friends. And of course, thank all of you for uh, you know, sitting through this talk. Okay, time for questions or comments. Do you have any questions or comments? Thank you very much. Thank yeah. you.
Okay, uh, welcome to the second session of the second day of Asia Group 2016. Um, I'm Mitsui Matsui from Mitsubishi Electric. I'm, uh, uh, it's, it's a great pleasure and honor to introduce uh, one of the uh, two papers that the uh, Program Committee of Asia Group 2016 uh, has decided uh, uh, to invite uh, to the Journal of uh, Cryptology. Uh, the title of the paper is uh, Nonlinear Invariant Attack, uh, Practical Attack on Full uh, Scream, Ice Cream, and Midori Sixth Hole, uh, written by Yosuke Todo, uh, Gregor Render, and Yu Sasaki. Uh, Todo san is going to uh, talk. Uh, please give us your talk. Thank you very much for introduction. So, my name is Yosuke Todo from NTT Sekia Platform Laboratories. So, today's my Talk title is Nonlinear Invariant Attack. So this work is joint work with uh, Gregor Renda in Ruhr University Bochum and uh, Yu Sasaki at the NTT Secure Platform Laboratories. Okay, so first of all, so I want to explain what happened by new attack. So this is a case study of uh, cryptanalysis on Scream. So Scream is a tweakable block cipher. So this is a uh, framework of uh, tweakable block cipher. So input is a plain text and secret key and tweak, and output is cipher text. So I find under the weak key setting, so Scream has following magical Boolean function g of x, and x is a 128 bit length. Then g of p plus g of c is always equal to g of t plus g of k for any plain text p. So this is an example. So now we choose tweak like this. And k is a secret key is chosen from the weak key space. And uh, in the condition of the weak key, so this four byte is always zero. So in this case, uh, g of k plus g of t is always one. And this is a plain text is uh, chosen from uniformly random. And the cipher text is computed from the screen block cipher. Then, so for any plain text P, G of P, is G of P plus G of C is always one. So, nonlinear invariant attack is a new type of cryptanalysis technique and, uh, and there's a weak key setting. And surprisingly, this attack is a practical attack. And uh, we can extend this attack to cipher text only message recovery attack and there's a reasonable assumption. And so, I have uh, three applications. So one is the uh, screen. Uh, this is a Caesar second round candidate's authenticated encryption. And ice cream is a first round candidate. And uh, this attack is, this attack is, uh, so attack uh, middle 64. So which is a proposal block, cip block cipher of last Asia crypt. So this is a summary of results. So nonlinear invariant attack has two type attack. One is a distinguishing version, another is a message recovery version. So in the distinguishing version, so it is very easy. We can only we only correct uh, k known plain text. Then so we can distinguish uh, the target cipher from ideal cipher. Uh, for success success probability is one minus two to the one minus k. And in the message recovery attack, so in the case of screen, we can recover 32 bits from only 33 software text uh, using uh, with the time complexity 2 to the 15. So it's a practical time, time complexity. And the wiki space, uh, but uh, our attack is a wiki attack. And the screen has a screen accepts 128 bit secret key. But the uh, weak key space is 2 to the 96. So the test is 2 to the minus 32. OK, so let's start the uh, main topic. So I first explain late related work. So nonlinear invariant attack has uh, two uh, related works. And the one is, uh, one is a stream from linear cryptanalysis. And another is a stream from invariant subspace attack. Okay, so first I explain uh, this stream. So 
as you know, linear cryptanalysis uh, was proposed by Matsui-san in 1993. So for the simplicity, I explained this attack uh, key alternating structure. So this is a round function. So xi is the input of the round function, and the xi plus 1 is the output of the round function. And uh, in the round function, the first uh, round key ki is xor, and this xor value is the input of the public function f. So the motivation of the linear cryptanalysis is to find linearly Boolean function fi and fi plus 1, such that uh, fi of x, uh, fi of xi plus fi plus 1 and of xi plus 1 is highly biased. And now, so f is a linearly Boolean function, so it is very easy to join uh, so two linear approximations. And so we can append a linear, linear approximation sequentially, we can create a linear approximation for a target cipher. So nonlinear cryptanalysis is natural extension of the linear, from the linear cryptanalysis. So linear cryptanalysis uses linear approximation, linear Boolean function. But uh, nonlinear cryptanalysis, so alternatively, uh, the, we use a nonlinear Boolean function, GI and GI plus 1, and satisfying uh, this x value is highly biased. So the advantage of the nonlinear cryptanalysis is uh, we can find uh, so nonlinear Boolean function uh, whose uh, bias is with more higher bias than linear cryptanalysis. So, but unfortunately, so the probability depends on the specific value. So now, x is if if x is a plain text, so it is easy because uh, attacker can know plain text value. But x i plus one depends on the round key, and att attacker can cannot know the k i. So the probability for next round uh, nonlinear approximation, uh, probability of nonlinear approximation depends on the specific value of x i plus one. So we cannot join nonlinear mask for two rounds. So this is an insurmountable problem. So nonlinear invariant attack uh, uses another idea. So nonlinear invariant attack, we first alternatively limit at the space of the round key. <coughs> but so we only focus on the nonlinear Boolean function GI plus GI and GI plus 1, such that this XOR value is always constant. So we don't uh, use a probabilistic be behavior. So now, so this is a probability, uh, probability one. So we can easily extend uh, this uh, nonlinear approximations uh, for the arbitrary number of rounds. And uh, for the simplicity, so if uh, we can find the nonlinear Boolean function G, and uh, so if as a, sorry, so, previous GI and the GI plus one, but uh, if uh, GI is equal to GI plus one, so this property, this property is preserved in arbitrary number of rounds if all round key is weak. Okay, so another stream is from invariant subspace attack uh, proposed by Lender et al. at 2011. So this is the overview of invariant subspace attack. So similar to the nonlinear invariant attack, as a round key space is uh, chosen from the weak key space. And first, the input x is chosen from the subspace u plus a. And uh, even if the key XORing, so u plus a, this uh, element always maps to u plus b. And even if the function f is separate, uh, this uh, element is maps to u plus a. And so repeat uh, this, uh, sub this uh, subspace. Uh, th so this subspace is preserved. So if the plain text p is chosen from u plus a, so cipher text is also, uh, cipher text also belongs to u plus a. So by using this property, uh, render attack uh, so many ciphers uh, using uh, invariant subspace attack. So nonlinear invariant attack is 
uh, similar to the invariant subspace attack. So, but the uh, invariant subspace attack uses a uh, such subspace, but nonlinear invariant attack uh, uses uh, this uh, uh, subset uh, satisfying uh, the output of G is zero or one. So, if uh, the <coughs> so this uh, element uh, maps to here and maps here and uh, repeat. So, but uh, in the nonlinear invariant attack, it is no problem if uh, this uh, subspace uh, goes to this uh, subspace. Because uh, we use G, we use, uh, so the function G is balanced function. So, thanks to this structure, invariant subspace attack is a chosen plaintext attack, but nonlinear invariant attack is non plaintext attack. So this is a distinguishing version, so it is very easy. Assume EK has a nonlinear invariant G. So correct K non plaintext uh, PJ, CJ, and uh, compute this XR value. And uh, for all pair, so this XR value is constant. And the probability that ideal cipher have this uh, pro property is 2 to the minus K plus 1. So next, so I want to explain uh, the extension to practical attack. So actually, we use uh, several attack assumptions. So she uh, chooses plaintext attack, non plaintext attack, and cyphertext only attack. So CPA is natural assumption for cryptographers, but uh, it is debatable in practical case. So, but uh, if uh, the target cipher was target cipher is broken and uh, this assumption, so cryptographer says that uh, this uh, target cipher is broken. So no plaintext attack is weaker assumption than CPA, and uh, if uh, the target cipher is vulnerable against this assumption, so it sometimes holds in practical case. So clearly ciphertext only attack is uh, weak, more, the most weak assumption. But it is unlikely to happen for cryptographers because uh, it is information theoretically impossible with that uh, assumptions. So, but if possible, it causes no negligible risks in practical case. So this is our attack assumption. So attacker can, uh, our assumption is attacker can correct multiple ciphertext blocks whose original message is the same but the IBO is different. So now we have one plain text block, and this plain text block is encrypted using different IBO, and we can correct this ciphertext block. In this case, so we can recover the plain text block from only ciphertext block. So I have to discuss uh, this assumption, whether this assumption is practical or not. So actually, it is very difficult to answer this question because uh, it depends on the application. So, but I think it is reasonable assumption because uh, example case. So, for example, application sometimes sends a cipher text of a password, and the, of course, password is a secret. And for the authentication, and the attackers know the behavior of the application, so attacker can correct the cipher text foods. Uh, original message is the same. So in such uh, situation, uh, we can uh, have uh, this uh, uh, framework. We can have this framework so we can recover the password from only ciphertext. So the attack procedure is very simple. So now EK has nonlinear invariant. And so this is the case of CBC mode. So now plain text is a secret and the uh, IV and the ciphertext is uh, public. So now EK has nonlinear invariant, we have this equation, and the, this value is always constant. So now CJ minus one is known, and CJ is known, but PJ is, guess, uh, PJ is uh, unknown. So we guess PJ and uh, confirm whether this value is constant or not. So, uh, so if we want to recover T bits from T bits of PJ, so trivially, so it, it requires two to the T time complexity. But uh, now, so we use a special nonlinear Boolean function G. 
So thanks to this structure, so practically the time complexity to recover t bits of pj is at most t2 to the 3. So next, so I explain how to find nonlinear invariance. So this is a core idea of the invariance subspace attack. So for the simplicity, assume as a KSP type round function. So this is a round function, and first uh, round key is XORD, and the S-box is, uh, S -box is uh, applied in parallel, and this output is diffused by the linear function L. So first, so I want to find nonlinear invariant for one S-box. But the size of S-box is generally small, for example, 4-bit or 8-bit, so it is not difficult to find nonlinear invariant for one S-box. So by exhaustive research, so we can find an uh, example for the S-box in screen, so like this. G of x is x1, x2 plus xl plus x2 plus x5. So this, value, this Boolean function is nonlinear invariant for a screen S-box. And then for all x and s is a screen S-box, g of x is always equal to g of s, g of s of x plus 1. And now, so we extend this nonlinear invariant to nonlinear invariant for the S box layer. So, but now S box is uh, independently applied. So the function GI is nonlinear invariant for the IS S box. So the sum function is nonlinear invariant for the S box layer for any uh, sum set. And next, uh, round key is XOR. So, if one in k, so round key k, uh, involved in only linear term of the function g, the sum function is nonlinear invariant for k x or in. So it's a very simple example. So this is a nonlinear invariant for the screen mass box. So x1, x2 is uh, involved in nonlinear term, but other term is only linear. So if k1 is equal to k2 is equal to 0, so this equation holds. So this is a nonlinear invariant. So finally, I have to overcome the linear, fu linear function L. So actually, it is the most difficult uh, so for the <laughs> to search for a nonlinear invariant. So as, uh, I find a vulnerable structure. So if the linear function is binary orthogonal, and there is a quadratic invariant for the S-box, so this sum function is nonlinear invariant for the linear layer. So this uh, property is derived from uh, the invariance of an inner product. So now, so the g is a quadratic function. So we can represent uh, this uh, Boolean function like this. And now, uh, let's focus on this term. So this is an uh, inner product. And so, M is a, but if M is a orthogonal matrix, so this uh, value is equal to this value, and this Boolean function is uh, completely equal to G of X. So this, uh, if L is a binary orthogonal and uh, G is a quadratic function, so such G function G is a nonlinear invariant for the linear layer. So finally, I want to explain practical attack on full screen. So, Scream perfectly follows our assumption. So, first, orthogonal matrix uh, was used uh, because, the, because of the duality of differential and linear cryptanalysis. And the nonlinear term is applied to only second and third row, but the round, cons round constant is only XORD with first row. So, round constant is not uh, so. Uh, so, round constant is not uh, important for the nonlinear invariant attack. And uh, all round key are the same as the secret key. So now, uh, nonlinear term is a second and third row. So uh, we choose weak key space, uh, weak key space, satisfying this, uh, this 60, 60, 32 bits is zero. So this uh, secret key is a uh, weak key. So, but, uh, so now, so uh, I want to explain how to 
break a Scream authenticated encryption. So Scream, so Scream uh, is authenticated encryption, and so unfortunately, the print text is directly input uh, of the EK. So, but let's focus on the last block. So last block as an input is only the length of PM minus one. So we attack the last block. Then P, the length of PM, P, PM minus one is unknown, but the length is known. So this value is known, and this value is known, and this value is unknown. So we guess PM minus one, and then recover this value. Okay, so I conclude my talk. So I propose a new type of cryptanalysis, nonlinear invariant attack, and uh, I explain how to find nonlinear invariant. And so I explain how application to uh, Scream, Ice Cream, and Middle East 64. And so we can recover the 32 bits of message in the last block on Scream and Ice Cream. And uh, in the Middle East 64, we can recover the 32 bits of message in every block. And there's a CBC, CTR, OFP, CFB uh, mode of operation. So thank you very much. Uh, uh, we have time uh, for a couple of questions. Oh, yes. Ad Beautiful result. Um, in the case of Scream, you were lucky that uh, uh, it had uh, just the right properties for your analysis, and uh, you could uh, uh, find out the uh, nonlinear invariant. Uh, in a general uh, scheme, uh, how would you propose checking whether uh, uh, the new block cipher which had been proposed has or does not have nonlinear invariant? The search space is huge. So, uh, is there any uh, mechanism how to do it? So, first of all, as a most difficult, uh, of the, mo the most difficult point of the nonlinear invariant attack is to overcome the linear layer. So, and, uh, so if uh, the linear layer is uh, trivially so overcome, so, uh, so nonlinear cryptanalysis is, uh, is, uh, successful, uh, was successful. So, maybe, Quadratic invariant, so if the S box is not quadratic invariant, so in this case, uh, I, I think nonlinear invariant uh, that doesn't work. So, but uh, if the S box is 4 bit, so I search for uh, almost well, many 4 bit S box, but the 4 bit S box always have nonlinear in quadratic invariant. So if we use 8-bit S-box, so it is very easy to avoid nonlinear invariant attack. So the 4-bit S-box, so it is difficult to avoid the nonlinear invariant for one S-box. So we need to use uh, so non-orthogonal non matrix or very high diffuse, high, uh, high dense uh, round constant. So if uh, such a, so a uh, countermeasure, so I think uh, nonlinear non invariant attack uh, doesn't work. I have two questions for you. Uh, the first, um, um, can uh, your brothers uh, attack? Can uh, to uh, can your brothers attack uh, uh, apply to other block cipher 
than uh, Scream. And uh, the second... Uh, sorry, sorry, the first question, so Scream? Sorry, I, I don't understand your question, so... Uh, uh, in your in your presentation, you can attack uh, to the screen, uh -huh. right? So I, I want to ask: uh, Can your robots attack uh, to um, uh, apply to other to other other block type? Uh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, so first, I and answer the question. So yeah. So. Uh, and, uh, so uh, f first of all, so the, our attack uses a weak attack, and so if uh, the target cipher is not lightweight block cipher, and that's a very complicated key scheduling algorithm, so it is very difficult to apply this attack. So, so as far as I search, uh, this, uh, this, uh, I, I can find uh, these three applications. But uh, as a target cipher, so first, let's see uh, the lightweight block cipher. And so with that key schedule, uh, lightweight block cipher with a very simple key scheduling algorithm. And so, it, so, so if uh, the additional application showing is possible, so such cipher is uh, maybe about a, as a possible as application. Thank you. And uh, another question. Yeah. Um, the final goal of your attack is to find the secret key or the plain text. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so the, uh, so I'm, so the, this type attack is a message recovery attack, so we never recover the secret key. So distinguishing version, so <laughs> actually we can recover one bit of secret key. So, because uh, from G of P plus G of, uh, G, G, G of P plus G of C is equal to G of T plus G of K, G of K plus G of T, and T is uh, public, and P and C is public, so we can recover G of K. And, and uh, this information is only one bit, so I don't have any idea to recover more than one bit.
second copy. Is it not recognized? Yes. Do you have a flash drive where you can copy on? Yes, you can uh, copy uh, there and uh, put it in. No, but if this doesn't work, this is broken apparently. It works? It works on my computer, it doesn't okay. work here, but do you have a flash drive? send an email? No, I did not send an email. Shall oh. I send an email? Now? Yes, you can send an email to uh, uh, Azure Email. No, okay, it's not too late for that. nhưng mà cái anh cho em biết cái thư mục mà đồng bộ nó thư mục nào em chưa đây này thông bóng ở đây có bóng sách đấy chưa có này ở trên đấy nó không có file thì ra nó không lấy về được nên làm nào để mình lấy về để bốn bài thì phải upload lên lên cái góc bóc chung ấy từ những cái máy con này nó mới lấy về nhưng mà ai upload cái đấy em không biết Ôi cái này là bên này cho anh hiểu mà cái bài slide em bài em có có đâu chưa anh ạ ở trên đó bóc có thấy đâu nó đang up to date này, này. đây có slide đây cho lên luôn nhé à, vào cái email anh để sẵn sàng email của anh đây ôn ôn bên ôn để vào cái thư mục là của mình 11 giờ 40. Chắc đây là 11 giờ 40 để em đổi đi. Đổi vào cái chắc 11 giờ 40. Nó đang ở đâu đây? Em tắt đi nhá. Đây vào một cái. Đâu đây chứ? Đang ấy giữ cái tên của nó mà ép thêm cái 11 giờ 40 vào. Ok, S đi. Ai chắc ở đây hả? Ai chắc ở đây, còn với R ở bên kia. Còn mấy cái kia là có chưa anh? Ba cái đầu, hai cái đầu chưa có thì bài này. 10 giờ 50, 11 giờ 11 giờ 15 chưa thấy cái bài này. Của thằng Khoa là gọi Khoa. Có cái giảm quên đây. Rồi, em vô đây nha, xem tình hình này. Năm rồi. Nhưng mà mỗi lần chỉnh xong, vào xong đây là quay lại nhưng mà em cứ ok thì là coi như là năm rồi em xem ở trên cái cầu hình ở trong cái phần mà NDI ấy là nó hiện thì là năm hay là hai năm
em tự xử lý ở trên máy này mà bên kia thì đủ rồi bên kia thì họ đã lốt xong bên r r rách thì xong rồi nhưng bên y thì chưa That part works fine, but the laser. No, no, don't look into it. Okay, you want. So we could use mine instead. I offer for this session. Yes. Can you okay, okay. It's good. Ah. Okay. 